Okay, two problems with the environment. Tangle bank, need to refresh the entire page and the locked up, the fact that data is locked up in the database and is not generally available to anybody who wants it. So, this ability to publish data on publicly onto the World Wide Web is basically what's dri driving a lot of the geo web, a lot of the applications that are being uh, built on the geo web. Increasingly, organizations and indeed individuals who collect data, rather than building specific applications, or, or let's say as well as building specific applications, web based applications or, or programs to uh, allow users to uh, access that data and query that data, they're also providing means by way p users can get at the data itself without needing to go through the interface so that they can do what they want with the data. Now, an application program, the word or the term application programming interface refers to, well, when I started learning about APIs, as far as I was concerned, they were all to do with data. And they were data APIs. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But the leaflet program, the open layers, they're advertised now as APIs. And I think the API has moved from being, or maybe I mis simply misunderstood what it was for, when I, at the beginning, but as I feel it's moved from <coughs> referring to just ways of getting data, accessing data and querying data over the web to be becoming more generally a set of tools that allow you to do something on the web. If that's right. So it's become a more generic uh, usage of the word. Anyway, that doesn't, that's really an aside. But basically an API, a data API, allows a client program to request data from a database using the HTTP syntax and using a published, so you, a published version of that syntax for accessing the database. And what, what, what the, the data is then returned, encoded in some kind of file format. Now, it's often XML or JSON, and we'll see what those are in a moment, what those formats are, but it could be one of a whole variety of other formats as well. It doesn't have to be XML or JSON. Uh, you may, the, 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 the requesting of data from a database using an HTTP request can be done directly from a browser, and I'll show that in a, in a moment. But as a URL, but in, it, it, its value is increased, or it, or it or it has extra value when it's called from within a page, and I'll try and explain this in in more detail. Rather than when the page is refreshed, so rather than every time the page is refreshed, what you do is you call your API call from within the page, and then you don't need to refresh the whole page. You just get the data back, update the page to reflect the, the data that's been returned. And that means that you're not constantly re having to refresh your page, which means a smoother user experience. And when it's used like that, it's called AJAX. And we'll go in a bit more detail in AJAX. So, how do these APIs work? And what's the structure of an API call? Well, here we are, this is it at the bottom. So, HTTP, we know, it's a web request. Then, just like any web page, we have an address to a server. You know, whatever that URL is, to a server. And then, what it is, instead of going being the address to a web page, it's an address to one of these web programs. So written in PHP or some other language. So this address up to the question mark would be the address to the API that you're calling. After the question mark, you can have a list of arguments or parameters defined as follows. Well, it's parameter and value pairs, where you have a parameter name and an equals and then the value of that parameter. Then if you're having another parameter, you put an ampersand symbol in 
and then parameter 2, base value 2. And you can have whole great long lists of these parameters. And these are the parameters that are picked up by the program and used by the program to decide what it's going to do to format an SQL query, for example. So let's see these in operation. Or let, oh, there we go. And out. So this is the same kind of diagram, process diagram, but kicking out JSON instead. We've got a browser here. We make an HTTP, but we click on something. OK, let's say it's our entangled bank. Let's say it's a web map. We've just turned on a particular layer, so we need to update that, get that layer data from the server. We sent off the HTTP request to the API. The, the fact that it's a, a program, Apache knows, as we know, so it forwards it on to the PHP program. The PHP program strips out the values from those the values for those arguments, uses them to compose, in this case, a database query, sends the query off to the Postgres or whatever, gets the results back. But instead of writing an HTML that includes the results in some fashion, we write a data file, JSON or JSON or an XML file. That, that JSON or XML file, file is relayed via the web server back to the browser, and then the browser takes that data file and updates its display on the basis of the data received. It keeps the HTML. The HTML and CSS and JavaScript of this page has stayed there the, the same all the time. So there's been no refreshing of that. No, no update of the HTML, no update of the CSS, no update of the JavaScript. But what we have updated is the data file a data file that is being leveraged, being used by those uh, uh, elements, so displayed by the CSS and the HTML, and being processed by the JavaScript. XML, what is XML? XML, it stands for Extensible Markup Language. So remember markup language, we've already met one, HTML. That's the language of the, the web. So. It's like HTML, but not HTML. And it's a markup language in that the data is defined, the meaning of the data is defined by tags, just like we did in HTML. Okay. So they, in this case, we've got records for a plant database. Is it plant? Uh, what is it? Database for that. Sorry. Uh, uh, a plant shop or something like that. So we've got, it's a catalog. So the first tag that we've got opens, it's called catalog, and opens the, the file. It declares that this is a catalog, whatever a catalog may be. It's just the word catalog. And then we've got, in the catalog, we've got three records defined by the tags plant. So the first one, plant, starts there, stops there. Got a common name, bloodroot. We've got a botanical name. Oh, I'm not going to pronounce that one. Zone. That's the, the climatic zone in which it grows best. We've got a plant. We've got some kind of light conditions, a price, and an availability, a sort of order number or something like that. I don't know how many are available in the in the in the, in the uh, warehouse, something like that. And as we can see, we've got three records. One, two, three records uh, for each one. And we've got the same fields defined in each record for each of those uh, plants. There is Now, while we've got one, one record or one tag for each of the fields for each plant, there is no requirement for, X, for XML to be like that. It can be formatted however you like or, or else. Similar to like, so if there was no price for this one, we could just exclude the price tag from there. We wouldn't need to include an empty field, for example. And as you can see, this represents effectively a table, a table with three rows and six columns. That's what it represents. Now, they have HTML and XML have slightly different syntax rules. So all XML tags must have an end tag. We know some HTML tags don't need end tags. 
and we know that uh, browsers, web browsers, are quite good at uh, reading HTML, even though sort of end tags are missing and things like that. It'll still interpret it. XML is not like that. It has to be well formed like this, with opening and closed tags. Also, XML tags are case sensitive, whereas HTML tags are not. So, catalog capital is not the same as catalog lower case. Okay, so it's case sensitive. And the other thing about XML is that they must be properly nested. They, the XML readers are a lot less uh, tolerant of missing closing tags and things like that. So be warned, it won't automatically close. If that common is missing, it won't, it will probably throw an error rather than decide that you've got a new tag there, therefore you're going to shut that tag down. So be warned. JSON, so XML was the original web language, and that's why it comes in AJAX. AJAX stands for asynchronous something in XML. Um, we can get a JSON in here. Decrease. Sorry, AJAX again in decrease. The other important exchange format on the web is called JSON, J JavaScript Object Notation. It's And it is very similar to how you code data structures in Java, hence that's why it's called JavaScript Object Notation. It is the object notation that we'll meet that we're going to use in JavaScript. And this has increasingly replaced XML as a web language, uh, mainly because it's what we call lightweight. So we can store the same information or data items, but with an, in a lot smaller space, which means we <coughs> send less bytes over the internet. Everything is smaller, more compact, runs quicker. So here's a sort of phone book, a phone entry, or an entry in a sort of address book or whatever in JavaScript notation. And in this case, we've only just got one record, but it's quite a complicated record. First of all, we can see, we'll see first of all, that the whole thing is enclosed in these curly brackets. And in JavaScript notation, that defines an object. So the whole thing here we regard as an object, one object. We then have some key value pairs, uh, first name, field first name, colon, value John, very simple to read, last name Smith, age 25, address. And then address is a compound data item which has its own, can be compartmentalized as itself, as an address. So we can see that as the address itself is an object embedded within the address object got the object, and that has a street address, a city state, and a postal code fields. We then have an attribute phone number as a key value pair, but the value of phone number is in these square brackets, which is an array, and an array is a list of things. So we've then got a list of objects, a list of two objects, each with an attribute of type, type of phone number, and what the phone number is. Okay. So we've got two objects in a phone number array. We've got an address object that contains a street object. Sorry, that contains one, two, three, four, five attributes. So address has five attributes. One, two, three of those attributes are just simple values. The fourth address contains an, obje an, an address object. The fifth phone number is an array of phone, phone number type objects. And that's the date one address record in JavaScript notation. Huh. OK, so those are the formats that are generally used to exchange data across the internet between computers. All right, let's see one of these APIs in action, a really basic one. OK, uh, can't get away from these insects and animals, can I? So Global Biodiversity Information Facility, I can never remember who I've told about what, about various applications. If, you, if I haven't told you about it already, it's a portal onto the world's museum records and species observation records. As of about three years ago, when this screenshot was taken, we've got data for one and a half million species nearly 500,000 500, 500 
million records, half a billion records available in this database. It's probably, wouldn't surprise me if it's nearly twice that size now, and we're talking about nearly a billion records that we've got access to. If we go to the relevant page, we can read about their API. There's a, so we can use the GBIF uh, page and we can go to a, a query it through their web mapping application here, the GBIF web mapping application, or we can use their web API to directly access the data in the database. So somewhere on their web pages, a uh, developer summary is a description of their API. So this will be the description of the address of the API and all the values, the, all the parameters and the values of the parameters that you can send to it. Okay, not going to go through those in any detail whatsoever because they differ between every API. But every API works in the same way with the, 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 the key value pairs uh, as arguments on a URL, but what those arguments are varies between API. So this is the taxonomy API from GPIF. So this is to get information on species names. Here's my PhD bug. Uh, that's female uh, saddleback bush cricket. Its species name is a fipiger, fipiger. So I want to know about the taxonomy of a fipiger, a fipiger. Taxonomy, what, you know, what, what class, what family it's in, that kind of stuff. So I can use the GBIF API onto the GBIF taxonomy to do that. So the API address is api.gbif.org, v1, species, match, question mark, and then I've got the parameter name equal to a fipiger, a fipiger. The percent 20 is a space, yes. It's the character that's used in the web to represent a space. My advice for all programming, whenever you do, avoid spaces, avoid funny characters, etc., etc. All right, so the percent 20, so it's a fipiger space, a fipiger. And this is what I get back in the browser if I type that URL request in. I get back some JSON not XML, it's returning me JSON. It's an object, it's a JSON object, and it's just a set of key value pairs. First one's sort of some kind of unique identifier, then it's the scientific name, a fipiger, a fipiger. that's the name of the person who described it, Freiburg, Ebig, Ebig, 1784. Then we've got things like its rank is a species rank, uh, we've got some all sorts of information about the quality of the name, but we now know it's in the kingdom, Amal Amalia, Phylum, Arthropoda, Order, Orthoptera, bush crickets and grasshoppers, family, Tetigodinae, that's the bush cricket family, and the genus, Fipiger. So I've got back some data by type typing in a web address with an argument. Okay. Um, this probably isn't the best. Okay, so I've got that, and that, that's how you get the data back. That's, that's a you can do that in a browser, you can get the data back. Now I just wanna, this is probably not the best order, but never mind. Um, so Ajax, so that is being done in a web browser. I put it in the web browser, it gets sent to the server, the GBIF server, the GBIF server returns the data that I want. But as I sort of said earlier, where, where this can really be beneficial is when you've loaded up your sort of web mapping application online, and then from that web mapping application, you want to, say, get a subset of data out. You want to request some data. And rather than refresh the entire web mapping application, we just want to fire off a little command to the server, say, get this data, return it to me, and then I update my application without having to refresh the entire application. And when you do that from behind the scenes, so to speak, in an, in an application, that's called AJAX, or AJAX is how it's referred to. And that AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. JavaScript, because JavaScript's the programming language that's mostly used for web programming and was originally used for developing the AJAX, the AJAX system. XML, because at the time it was developed, XML was the, is, was and remains the de facto web language, led data language of the web. JSON is a relative, new, relative newcomer, 
but it's got quite a lot of traction because of its, uh, its lightweightedness. So basically, this AJAX is a background request from the browser to a server to request data. That means that we don't have to update the web page fully, only the bits that we need to in, that reflect the data to result in a, in a smoother uh, user experience. So this is a, this is a comparison diagram of the AJAX and the class, what's called classic web map architecture, which I had for uh, the Entangled Bank. So the Entangled Bank works like this. You put in, you've got the web page here in your browser. You press some kind of request for some kind of update. Uh, I run the query in Entangled Bank. That sends the HTTP request. Everything is locked out on the browser while we're waiting for that, for the web page to be refreshed. The web server application, this is time going this way, spends its time chugging away, doing its stuff, returns the results back to the web page, and then when that result comes back, the web page is refreshed and the user then gets access to using it again. So there's a period while you're waiting for this response where you're locked out of the system. For an AJAX-based system, you've got your web application, you've got your web application up and running, and when you click to make a query, instead of refreshing the whole page and the page getting locked out, behind the scenes, a little JavaScript call is made to what's called the AJAX engine running on the browser. Uh, the AJAX engine then pumps off the request to the web application. The web application, or the website API then does its stuff, returns the XML data or the data in whatever format it is. The AJAX engine then absorbs that, takes that data in, and then what it does is it processes it and updates the web page. But the important thing is while this is going on in the background, the user can still interact with the web page that's, that's online. It won't reflect this update. It won't, the page won't have updated with the new data until this has been returned, but that it, may, it may well be that you can do something else while you're waiting. Okay, so the web page is still active. So that means, a little diagram, so for the classic system, you get user activity on the browser, you post your request, you sit there waiting for the server to do something, comes back, you get user activity, but you get this stilted user experience. With an AJAX system, you've got, basically, you've got continuous user activity. You've got this sort of intermediate workplace where you're pumping your requests and that are processing the requests and the return and updating the reply, the, 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 the use, updated the, the interface when the results return, but the, the, the interface itself is never locked out from the user. And you may have multiple of these processes going on in the background while you're working away on the uh, interface itself. I, right towards the end of developing the Entangled Bank, I actually did implement a tiny bit of uh, a, and a, a small amount of API and a small amount of AJAX-based queries that effectively cut out this middle section and allowed the web browser to directly uh, communicate with the Postgres database. But I won't go into it. I'll maybe talk about that a bit more in the, when I do the second half of the Christmas lecture. All right. So we now know how APIs work, and we know what we use them for. What about the GeoWeb? Okay, so basically the GeoWeb is about APIs that implement some kind of spatial service. And like most things on the web, they usually follow the Open Geodata, Geodata Consortium standards. And the particular two that we're interested in, the most important two are the web mapping services and the web feature services. But there are other types of standards as well for things like geos, geocoding services and other things like that. So a web mapping service delivers a map as an image over the internet. And as image files, they can be read by any software that uh, can display an image and allows the sending of a, of a URL, the URL. So 
So we can view the web map services in web browsers, web mapping software such as uh, Leaflet or uh, Open Layers, but also we can absorb them and consume them in desktop GIS or subject desktop GIS as well. Uh, examples of web map services include Google and Bing Maps. When you go to Google Maps, you get a map returned, you do a search, you get a map returned. It's not actually returning you vector layers or anything like that, it's just returning you an image. That's all it is. It might have some vector data overlaid on top, but the background mapping is just a JPEG, some kind of image. Um, you also, there's a related thing called tile map services, which are related to web map services that aren't uh, OGC standards. We'll be meeting those in some of the practical classes as well, but they do a similar thing. They deliver images, but it's using a different kind of approach. Okay, so what goes on here? Okay, so in this case, I'm going to type a, uh, an API for a web map service into my browser, sends out my HTTP request to the, to the relevant uh, web server. Now, the web server sees that, uh, can tell, because of the configuration of the URL, that it's a web, it's a web map service request, not a normal web request. And it knows that it's been configured to know that web mapping requests are being dealt by a piece of software, in this case, called GeoServer. GeoServer is one of the examples of a web mapping, a web server, or map server, web map server. So Apache says, I can't handle that, that's spatial, basically. Hands it over to whatever program has been configured as the one to receive the web map service requests. In this case, the, web, the map that the server is going to produce is uh, the data for it is in a Postgres database. So we get a dry, it configures, the, the, the geo server absorbs the web map request, turns it into a SQL query, pumps it to the database, gets the results back from the databases, and then writes the JPEG file that is then returned to the browser. Okay. So we've got another piece of software in there, our web map server software. So here's an example of one. This is the British Oceanographic Data Center. Again, published page with the, with the details of the API on. This is for bathymetric chart of the world, so uh, depths under the ocean map. Uh, and you can see here, to find out more about the links, you can uh, see the various, uh, click on here to get the various instructions, the various details for the parameters and their values you can send. So if I type that URL into my web browser, I get that map back. So there's the address up to the question mark of the server. It's a get map request. I'm wanting a, dump, a, web, a web map service. There's the bounding box for the map to return. Uh, I'm asking for it in a JPEG format, as opposed to a PNG format or a GIF format. I'm asking for a particular layer, which is this uh, bathymetric layer. And I'm saying to display it 900 by 600 pixels. And this is just the version of, I think, the WMS request version or something like that exactly what that parameter is. But if I type that into my web browser, I get this Im image back myself, which is great. Now, clearly that's useful, but frankly, I'm not going to be typing URLs like that on a regular basis to see a picture of part of a, the world. Mostly, these are written automatically by program, these URLs. They're designed to be programmatically built up rather than typed by hand. So for example, uh, ArcGIS will do it for you. If you go to catalog, you can configure a map, web map service access in catalog. So we're in catalog, we can add a web map server, we add in the address of our uh, web map server, we, and that's all we need to do. We can then, I think, put, press get layers to choose which of those layers we want to, to, to display. OK, and we'll create a link to that web map server, and then we can display that data in on our maps. Now, this is displaying in, in, in ArcGIS, and I can zoom in, zoom out, and I can pan, and that will automatically 
Whenever I do that, ArcGIS basically updates programmatically these bounding box things, these widths and sizes, programmatically updates that to represent the figures that are actually, that represent the, the, the condition of the screen in our <laughs> map, automatically updates these, pumps that request through to the British Oceanographic Data Center and gets the map back. So I can pan, I can zoom on that map just like I could any other map. So that's web map services, they're pretty simple. Um, no, you ha if you have other players, you can yeah, the whole map into that I think it, I s it's a good question. I, I, I would suspect, that, yeah, I don't, I suspect it will send the projection back as part of the web map service and then it will be projected on the fly, but I would have to check, you, no. you can't trust these things, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You may be restricted to certain projections, yes. But then ArcGIS should be able to project. It should know, ArcGIS should know what projection this thing is sent in. So it should be able to translate, um, reproject it on the fly, but it couldn't do probably an accurate reproject. So you might end up with a, the 100 metres or whatever out like you, you often are, yeah. Yeah, not sure about that. I've, to be honest, I've hardly ever, I've never consumed these practically, so... Yeah. Okay, so there are lots of problems with configuring these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, web feature services. So web feature services, there's no GCC standard for sending spatial data rather than an image of spatial data, a map image. So you can send vector or raster data across the internet using a web feature service, and it's usually encoded in this another markup language called GML, a which is called Geog Geography Markup Language. I think it's geography. I always call it geographic, but I think technically it's geography markup language. So because it returns a GML, which is a flavor of XML, it's not really suitable for visible. You can't view the vector data or the raster data in a web browser like you could for the web map service. Instead, it has to be consumed by programs that, like open layers like ArcGIS that are, are built to con consume this GML. Web feature services are particularly important for, well, they're the way of distributing vector and raster data, but they also support the ability to post back to the original server to update the data on the server. So this is, for example, how if you're running a doing field data capture of a utility company or something like that. You've got the copy of the uh, corporate database with you on your tablet out in the field. You see that something's wrong. You make an update on your tablet. Then you can post that update back as a web feature service to the server and to have that data integrated into the server back, back on the server. So you can use this for updating your corporate records from a remote data capture uh, system or elsewhere. So where so so this is what geog geography markup language looks like. If you if you type a, re uh, a web map service request, the request the full request is up at the top there. If I type that into my browser, this is the kind of response that I get. You can see this is a it, it's it's uh, basically XML, but it's XML specially designed for Geographic, returning geographic data or formatted in the geography markup language style. Uh, again, this is not for, con for consumption by human beings, but consumption by machines. So the fact that we, all you can see is fuzz there doesn't really matter. We don't need to know the details of geography markup. Okay, just with web map services, for web feature services, they should be a web page that tells you the details of the web feature service, how to parameterize it to get the result. This one, it returns information on earthquakes. Return it, we can get it in GeoJSON, we can get it in CSV. Uh, so it's an earthquake data, data or so feed for, o, for, for earthquake data, I believe by the G New Zealand, this is from the New Zealand uh, 
theological service, I believe. Again, now just good old ARC GIS. Do, will it do the things the same way as everybody else? No. A web feature service in ARC map is just a web map service, so they, they use different, the same, they call both web feature services and web map services web map service. So you use the same thing to open up the interface, you set up the address of the uh, delivery, then you do the other bits and bobs. And we end up with a layer, in this case it's all the earthquakes that were being served out by that uh, New Zealand uh, earthquake database. Okay, so remember this. Distributed, so this is the uh, Pacific Disaster Center map. So hopefully we now know that this is a distributed web map in that the data is coming from different locations. We have got the base map. It, I don't know where it's actually come from, but it looks like a Google Earth base map. If it's not Google Earth, it's going to be Bing or one of the other competitors. It's a base map. We should now know that that base map is being grabbed as a web map service from somewhere. So that's a web map service, the base map. On top of that, we've got these vector points, also some vector lines, and uh, also some labels and names and places. These will be web feature services delivering vectorized data as web, probably through a web feature service. So this map is, a, is both web map service and web feature service, which is on top. Earth browsers, I wasn't quite expecting that, but there they are. Okay, Earth browsers, what are Earth browsers? Earth browsers are, I'll tell you why I wasn't expecting it, because I give almost the same lecture to my first years, but it's so it contains slightly different contents and different details, so I'm never quite sure what's gonna turn up. Anyway, Earth browsers. So we're familiar with Earth browsers. Well, we're familiar with Google Earth, hopefully. Be aware that Google Earth is not the only Earth, uh, Earth browser by any means. There are quite a few others. Microsoft has a variety, has one. There's a whole variety of different ones nowadays. So while Google Earth is the first and in many ways still the biggest, <coughs> it's not the only one on offer. Okay, so. Earth browsers, oh, there we go, there's a few of the others. Microsoft, Encarta, NASA, Whirlwind. Um, so these are programs that you download onto your computer and then access the virtual globe. The virtual globe is basically being delivered as a web map surface service. There's a web map service and web feature services, but they're embedded over a globe. Or, or, or wrapped onto a globe rather than being shown on a flat map. It's basically the same technology, but on a sphere rather than a uh, rather than on a flat map. Uh, we don't need to go into any great details about that. So it's basically the base maps are served as a web map server, things like that. One thing to think that, that's relevant to this is that. Um, oh, let's see. Have we got? Uh, is the idea, sorry, the idea of thick and thin clients. Um, I thought I had a better soft slide than this, but I lost it. Okay, so thick and thin clients. So all this idea differentiates is between, is basically how much of the process is being, goes on on the server versus on the client. If most of the processing and things goes on on the client, on, sorry, on the server, you need a very small program running on the client. You, have to, you only need a small program on the client. So, for example, for the entangled bank, all the processing basically was going on on the server, and all I had was a tiny little mapping application that allowed you to draw on it and press submit, basically. That's all it did. So there was very little code on the client side. Google Earth requires you to download an entire and install an entire program locally to use the web-based uh, web map services and feature services that get put that get uh, draped on top of it. The more you have to, if you have to install a program on a local computer, or you have to sit there for a while waiting for the application to download over the internet, a large amount to download over the internet, we tend to call it a thick client because most of the processing is going on locally. 
thick on your, ma your machine is thick with code. A thin client has a very little going on on the client, lots going on in the server. So sometimes you'll just see applications described as thick clients or thin clients. All it really does is say how much is going on on the local machine and you may well need to install additional software on a local machine to run it with a thick client. Right. Uh, these are just, just to show these buildings and everything. These are all delivered exactly in the same way, web map services, web feature services in slightly different ways. <laughs> okay, just finish off with the cloud. The cloud. What is the cloud? The cloud, or cloud computing, is an architecture. So it's an example of an architecture. It's just an architecture in which services are delivered across the World Wide Web. So you may see jobs and things like job adverts and things like that where they say, are you familiar with software as a service? Software of a service is one of these buzz phrases that goes around the cloud because you, rather than having downloading and installing software packages on your computer, you just log on to a server which supplies all the relevant uh, functionality that you need. So uh, there are lots and lots of cloud-based services, blogs, version controls, Dropbox storage, visualization, social networks, and of course mapping applications that we're interested in, including Esri Online, CartoDB, MongoDB, there are many, many Mapbox, many, many of these applications now. So cloud-based providers usually, depending on the, what service they're providing, usually provide a, a certain amount of storage space uh, and access to whatever you've, your data that you've uploaded, the stuff that you've uploaded into that storage space, for tools to access that content and possibly, depending on who they are, perhaps you're allowed, if you've got a database as part of your, your, your cloud-based system, maybe an API onto your database. Maybe, depends who you are. Uh, the important thing about cloud computing is that it removes the need for the users to manage their hardware and software. And increasingly, this is the world that we live in where effectively companies and organizations are outsourcing many of the IT needs that they used to manage in-house. It's exactly the same with Kingston University. Kingston University used to run its own uh, blogging so site. No, it doesn't. It now subcontracts that out to somebody else. The H drive. There is no, the unit H drive is not occupied on a computer owned by the university on university property. It's somewhere else. I think it might be in Amsterdam somewhere or something like that. So things are increasingly, the cloud is being used not just by individuals, but by organizations as well. That's great. OK, so me on the cloud. Pictures of me sitting on clouds? No. OK, so I exist. I am on Facebook for my sins. I am on, what's this one, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, so social network for professionals, in theory. If you're not on LinkedIn, you anybody not on LinkedIn? Start, time to start maybe making up a profile, making a few contacts. I've also, I write occasional blogs. It's very, very occasional. I don't, I don't know why I bother even keeping it up occasionally, but I do have blog space. I have YouTube channels of various kinds, the ones that I stick your videos up on, the one I stick my own videos up on. So I have a YouTube presence. I have a Pinterest presence. I have a GitHub presence. GitHub, if you're not aware, is the social networking for coding or more generally version control. So it started on, off as a social networking site where you can share code and work together on developing code. But actually people have discovered that code is just a stored in a text file, and you can use exactly the same software for managing change in code to manage change in any documents you like, including data files. So people are using GitHub now to track changes in databases through time by tracking the changes in the files that, that make them up. Uh, so that's quite interesting. So instead of there being one cloud, the reality is I am spread across many clouds very thinly. 
And the connection between those clouds is frankly pretty appalling. Um, I, most of them are semi-isolated. I might be able to, I, I've got some connections, so if I, po if I stick something on Pinterest, uh, an image on Pinterest, I can pump through a notification onto Facebook or Twitter, and if I, put, if I tweet, I can pump it to Facebook, and if I face it or whatever, Facebook it, I can pump it to tweet it to Twitter if I'm so inclined. If I lower a YouTube video up, it may get updated on my Facebook, etc. But they're pretty weak, and really, we're talking about a whole, we live in a world of isolated clouds that aren't really connected to, to each other particularly strongly, or not, not without quite a bit of effort on your own account, I think. And if we remember, did we see this map before? Yeah. And of course, what, what most of these giant circles are, of course, these, these are these cloud-based computing environments, the Googles, the Facebooks, the use, and they are increasingly taking up larger and larger proportions of the internet, and certain people's entire experiences of the internet or the World Wide Web are now restricted, I suspect, to just a few of these hyper-connected nodes and what with the joys of the Trump election and things like this, we, we're hearing about people being within their own news bubbles and things like this. Increasingly, we, we can uh, balkan or s settle ourselves in one of these environments, configure it so we're only listening to people whose views we like, and we're, we're no longer in an interconnected world, we're in our own little bubble world. ArcGIS Online. Um, so we're not using ArcGIS Line in this module, but you do have access to it. I do recommend you um, have a play with it. And indeed, I'm, I'll maybe stick up some uh, instructions if, for just basically how to make ArcGIS Online maps if you want to. This runs in exactly the same way as Google Earth. So there's a base map being served in a web feature, ser a web map server. Then we've got our point locations being uh, added on as a web feature service on top. Just to say with ArcGIS Online, there's a cloud-based supplier. It's, a, it's their cloud-based mapping system that it's not just producing maps. It's, it, it's, it's sold as an entire uh, corporate product for organizations, unsurprisingly. So it, not only can we embed the maps, you can make maps online, which is its basic functionality. You can embed those maps within web pages. You can also configure those maps for distribution, easy distribution to various mobile devices, mobile phones, stuff like that. You basically point, press a button and say, make an app out of this map, and it will make, do it for you. Um, they, it integrates with Microsoft Office and the, the corporate uh, document systems. It allows you to publish APIs. So you've got an API. You can publish a data API as well as a mapped version of the data. Also, obviously, links through to the uh, desktop software and things like that. So just a final, very final note of caution. So the cloud, the cloud in cloud-based services are obviously a huge, huge now. And rightly so. I mean, they've, they've made so much functionality accessible to so many people that was not available before, particularly in respect to the sharing of stuff across social networks. But... There's very few things in life that are totally free, unsurprisingly. So most cloud services, many of them have a free entry level, entry level with no cost. But often those, those, are those services that you get for free are quite limited. Maybe you're only allowed so many rows in your data table. Maybe you're only allowed so many data tables, for example. Other things are that uh, they restrict uh, Things like your, whether you can keep data private. So many free services, the data, if you upload data, it has to be public. So I think Esri's like that. You can't have private data on a free Esri online account. You have to have a proper full account before you can make your data private. So while you get software and your data looked after, what are you giving them? Potentially, you are giving them to write, often to publish the data. Sometimes you're even giving over your ownership of your data to the, to the company by uploading it to the system. You've given up custodianship of your data, potentially the rights to, to keep, it, 
keep it, uh, or the ability to keep it private. Uh, different sites, web, uh, cloud-based systems have different thing, rules and things to do with limits of free speech and expression, which may or may not be an issue. One of the ongoing ones on Facebook is the nipple, the female versus male nipple controversy. I don't know whether you've seen that. Male nipples are allowed, female nipples are not allowed. So there's an attempt to, <laughs> to uh, make, that, make one rule for all. Okay, uh, there's a danger that the more you use something, the more you're going to be locked into a vendor's system. So I've been using Pinterest for a couple of years now. I've got several thousand images online. I don't particularly want to, it might be difficult for me physically to get all those images back uh, or not. I don't know whether it, I'm, I'm totally locked in. So unless I'm able to download my entire archive, I'm, I'm locked into Pinterest for a while. Also, these companies change the rules as you go along. So you may have signed up for Facebook five years ago and then discover they've decided to change their rules five years later and you've, they've already got your stuff and uh, you can't object. Well, you've either got to shut your account down, shut everything down, or you've got to go with the rule changes. And of course, not available on, offline. This is, you know, in the modern world, we perhaps don't think about this, but uh, if, we're going to, if we're going to Norfolk on field work, mobile phone reception up where we go is pretty dodgy. So as soon as we're relying on cloud-based web mapping applications and we're on, the, on an island off the Norfolk coast or in a place where there's poor reception, we're immediately in trouble. Something as simple as that can be a, a sort of game breaker if you spend a decent amount of time, a reasonable amount of time in, in, in slightly inaccessible places. Oh, we won't bother with that. Okay, so I think that's all I've got to say on architecture. Hopefully it's given you a picture of the bits and bobs that exist, these web servers, how they talk to each other and how they communicate with each other. So the practical is we're carrying on with your home page, basically CSS, uh, HTML, CSS. But for the practical classes, you can just plow on. They're all there. You can just carry on. So if you've done your CSS, you can work, start on your JavaScript and... And next week I'll talk about the application. So I'll give you a next week I'll give you a breakdown of what we need for the next assignment.